Hi, welcome to NL Interviews. And today we have with us Masood Khalili. Am I pronouncing that right? That's right. Uh, the current Afghan uh, ambassador to Spain and the author of Whispers of War, which Sage published this year, and I've just been told has been translated into Spanish, French, and English, as of right now. And Russian. And Russian. It will be coming out, or is it already? Yes, very soon. Oh, which is especially exciting, because Whispers of War takes place specifically in Afghanistan between 80 and 86. That's right. And which was a highlight, and this is where um, I would love your input, because as I look at most of our audience, who I suspect are very young, their understanding of Afghanistan in the 80s is from Rambo 3, and which pretty at good. least featured the Russians, I suppose. Very good. But, but that, that's pretty much a front row seat to what's been happening since, right? Like what would, what would um, so just a brief overview for all the, well, I'm looking mostly at our audience here, but who are also fairly young. So what's happening in Afghanistan prior to 80 at this point? Well, first, thank you very much that you have read this book. Oh, this is important, I tell you that. When you ask questions, I know that, especially when you said you too, Commander Masood, and you like coffee, I liked it. Indeed, thank you. And I am plugging And number mind. two, that I tell you this was a different, very different time. You are not born or you were just five years old when I was in the mountains with my donkey to mobilize my people. I was a political officer and I had to mobilize people because if you don't mobilize your people, the enemy mobilizes them, which is very important. So I was in the mountains sometime with my donkey, sometime with my heart, sometime on foot, 13 times all over my country from village to village, river to river, mountain to mountain, town to town, mosque to mosque, above all, heart to heart. You met with everybody in all of these encounters. Absolutely. You mentioned this. In Going fact. to the high mountains, staying there for two, three days with no food. And um, I, was, I was okay, but I was time time thinking about my donkey that he was hanging here with me. <laughs> no, I tell you that. This is a fact. I, I believe it. Your donkey men is mentioned a lot. A lot of chapters oh, are dedicated to... He was my to companion. Him. What was his name, though? We don't put donkeys a name. We put for wondering. horses, unfortunately. Oh. You know what just, well, I was calling him sometime, oh, my donkey. But he was indeed... I was talking about him because... I think he was very patient, more patient than me, more helpful than me. In one of my dialogues, imaginary, he was really bombarded and he was in blood. And I asked, I said, I cannot leave you alone because you have been with me for the last two months walking. And I took this notebook of mine, which was always in my back, writing for my wife. Right, right. Yes, and I looked into his eyes and I, as I, he's asking me, why you're fighting? Why you kill each other? Have you, have you ever seen a donkey killing the, another donkey? Have you ever seen a donkey burning the house of another donkey? Have you ever seen a donkey is cheating another donkey? I said, no. He said, who are you then? I said, we are human being between you and me. We are doing these things. So I was going with this notebook and I was writing sometime even every hour to my la wife because she was with Mahmoud, my son, was living in a refugee camp in Pakistan. Right. I think he was um, six months old at the time, uh, at least in the start of the book, right? And uh, Mahmoud was seven years old. Seven years, I'm just sorry. And the other one was six months, my Joe, the second sorry. one. And so I was coming from the mountains for maybe a week or so, giving that notebook to her and say, bye-bye for another trip. No telephone, no communication, no telegraph, no road, no postal system. Once I was gone, then for her, I was gone. That's this good. book, which is Whispers of War, is indeed a mirror of the plight pain, suffering, lament, laughter, tears, smiles, and above all, 
hope of the people. I, w I was going to say, um, for a book that is, that seems very depressing in scope, it's actually very lyrically optimistic. Oh. And, and you mentioned this, I mean, this is a land that has been seeing bloodshed and is still, um, I mean, it is exceedingly optimistic. Um, and, and that's one of the things I resonated with because, I mean, as you can tell, we are going through our own problems here. I know. And, and optimism know. is in short supply. And, and so the idea sure. that you can look at something with that kind of scope and say, hey, look, you know, things will get better. So, yeah, can we... Can we Absolutely. Uh, but, um, yeah, no, but can you give us a quick idea? So what is happening in Afghanistan right now? You said you had to mobilize the people. And at why that, that time. This book that time, belongs right? to that time, which is 30 years before. Right. And I've, I've got 40 notebooks which will be published slowly and gradually. Not that slowly because I die. I mean, so <laughs> that is, I'm, I'm old and... Uh, but Actually, here, yeah, you mentioned that at the end where you're not sure if you will come back, where you've sent this oh, out and you're yes, like, I'm so not sure if I'll be alive to yeah, see this well, published, well, but do whatever you I want. Know. I thought it was, I was, again, optimistic. Like what should have sounded so depressing is still this very hopeful, well, at least this is here. I tell you one thing. No, I mean it when I say I tell you one thing, because if you're optimist, you live forever. If you're pessimist, you die every minute. Never be, because what you have in your hand, the candle of hope, especially for poor people. People were dying, bombardment, killing, hunger. Animals were dying, but the kids were more I mean, stronger indeed in this book what I've written, sometimes more than us and say, wow, look at this boy, he's 10 years old and he gives lesson to me, which was at that time 37 years old. Look at this boy. That is optimism and hope, which I think in this country, in India, millions go to bed hungry. And when you go to bed hungry, what she or he has, well, I'm hungry tomorrow morning. If I wake up, that will be the darkest thing. No, I'm hungry tonight. Maybe tomorrow I'll be okay. That is the optimism of the poor in a bit where he's going every, almost every night, if not totally hungry, at least empty stomach. No, and what you said about the children as well. I was thinking about the two girls with the slingshots, right? Yeah. It's like every day they come out, every day this is a thing that they're doing. It doesn't matter that their whole world is changing. That's, that's to me so fascinating. But because it doesn't matter, you have today, and I think. Um, and, and so, yeah, so uh, this book is now published almost 30 years after you first set out. Uh, right. And right. You know, and so I'm curious, um, what has changed in that time in relationships? Uh, like what's happened in Afghanistan, definitely what's been happening with, uh, I mean, the Soviet Union back then uh, versus now, I think. Now, a lot of things changed. Number one, that the people of Afghanistan, when they promised that they get freedom, they got it. Which That's is so important. Most important. Right? Red Army, KGB, one of the superpowers in a bipolar system, and you challenge nothing in your hand and say, I will get my freedom from your hand. And they got it. No, so and that's incredible. Last, yeah, yeah. What we did, I think I don't want to go to politics more here because I am not, you know, you know that I was with that hero and he died and I survived and I've lost my eye, I've lost my ear. So when I see that in every war, first we should not have war, you know. Can you? We have not burned the house of each other. So here what I tell you that when I was in the whole book, and I was in Afghanistan. Believe me, I fought because I hated war. I fought because of peace. I fought because of subject that I hated subjugation. I hated chains. Same thing common people did it. And there, in any war, 
First, you should not have it. You should have a vision. If you don't have a vision, what will happen? You win war, but you lose peace. Okay. No, that sounds very complicated. Explain that to me okay. a little bit. First, I mean, it's simple. You are fighting, supposing you're married, you're fighting with your wife. But you all of a sudden talk, discuss, and you win the war. But, and then you lose the whole piece of the house. What is using winning that war? When we entered Kabul, another war started. Okay. So when another war started, we did not have that vision that if we reach Kabul, or you fight in India, and then you reach Dilfar in India, reach Delhi, and then reach Delhi, and see that, War has not stopped, another war has started. So, in that case, you but have that's to. That's internal. Have um, internal. Which was indeed, to a large extent, not, believe me, not because I was there, uh, not because our fault. We were, we were, no doubt, not free of fault because we made mistakes, as I told you that vision. But there, always pray that you or you are locked by good neighbors, not by bad neighbors. Because you live, since we were landlocked, and then unfortunately Pakistan had a kind of a strategy, which we didn't know it before in the war. You mentioned this, both in the book and in your TED talk, where there's this interference coming. You say Pakistan's one of them, and then you, you don't mention the other country. But this has been going on now for, for a while now, this, this kind of I think you are, you, you, your people should know it. This is something which has not stopped. And people of Pakistan should know this. Before every other nation, that the war in Afghanistan is indeed because of the uh, wrong strategy of a group in Pakistan which is called ISI. And that is first at the expense of the poor people of Pakistan. They are poor. They are human beings. They, they are, you know, a part of this globe. Why they should suffer so much? Taliban, Al-Qaeda, Daesh. I hope they take the lesson. And I hope the people of them do not suffer more and do not give suffering to other people. So this is the war is still going on. Kind of that, not war against the Soviets, because that was a very big right, one no, and the whole but people. But this is what we've inherited from them now. I mean, you think? I think not from, not much from them. Okay. Because when they, when they, were defeated and left Afghanistan. See, they said, uh, you know, that's Vidani, yeah, means goodbye. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yes. Thought, well, this is the time that go because country is 80% ruined, people are poor, and then go and then go further and then go to Central Asia. But at that time, communist regime was still there, Soviet Russia was there. Go to these countries dreaming in a kind of uh, mouse dreaming of a chocolate which cannot get it. <laughs> That's beautiful. How am I? Yeah, no, because... Um, I want to make it simpler. You know? it, no, no, that yeah, is simple. Right. It also reminds me of a lot of their, um, the Soviet cartoons we grew up on. So I had to learn Russian in school because oh, in the good. early 80s there was this very oh, Indo-Russia, we're, we're all friends together in this. Very and good. then suddenly, you know, that was probably the last generation mm -hmm. that had to um, but I always find that interesting because while that's going on here, this is what's going on in Afghanistan. Good point. This is what's going on in Pakistan, right? And so you have these three countries landlocked, very similar languages, culture, and yet you're not seeing a lot of literature being traded or spread, yes. right? And that's, that's this resistance to each other. Yeah. And I mean, you've been a diplomat for many years at this point, many different countries. Like that. And so be curious about your, your experiences dealing with all these? Oh, no, I mean, I was, first I've got a lot of experience here in this country. I think I'm more Diliwala than you. And I was, when I was young, I was very much, very much fond of, 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 of classic films, you know, and classic music of India. And uh, 
and Bismillah Khan, that Shahnai and oh, Ramesh yeah. Shankar. Oh, yeah. that was my, that was always my my dream to see them. And I met Bismillah Khan. Oh, wow. Okay. Uh, it was very, very moving time, I tell you. Oh, when was that? Where was and that? When I was ambassador here for nine One years. One of the perks. Yes, and then I... I, they invited us to uh, Lal Kala, and we went there, and they said, Bismillah Khan will be there. And I said, wow, this will be great to see. I went with my wife. You know what I saw? Which always I remember it. I saw the president of India was there. I don't remember who was it when he came. Oh, my goodness, I could not believe it. He touched the foot of Bismillah Khan. I was watching it. I said, oh, my goodness, look, look at the, the president of India is touching that because of the culture and music. Who is now the emperor of the world? Bismillah Khan. And who is really emperor of the world? The president of this country who understood that I should bow to him, to his music. I studied in Dr. Hussain College, Karorimal College. Oh, wow. I did my BA, MA, and I was on the way to doing St. Stephen College, my, my PhD that Soviets or the, the communists took over. Soviets followed. My father, he was ambassador, called me and said, what do you do? I'm doing, I'm doing my PhD in St. Stephen College. What is that? I said, so my father said one thing very good. I want to, Your, those who watch me now, listen especially to fathers, that, son, you know that Ru the communists are in Kabul? I said, yes. Son, you know that the Russians will be there? I said, yes. Said, Leave doing PhD, go to, the, to, go to the mountains of your country. I said, what about my PhD? Very clearly said, get your PhD from the mountains of your country, from the school of the common people. Father is also a poet. And I said, definitely I do it. And this, these notebooks are because of the product of that. You go somewhere for a good reason. And you discover your land. Because I was a boy in Kabul, you know, in, in metropolitan. I didn't know my, my, you know, country. When I went to the mountains, I discovered it. I said, wow, what a people. So generous, so nice so brave, but so poor. Poverty doesn't make any difference as long as you have a hope and a dream and work for that. They have a hope and a dream. They give life for that. You have read in this book and they got it. Uh, There's this um, excellent line and, and I'm probably getting the order wrong, and I forget who, you, you'd stayed at someone's house and they'd made you parathas, right? And then and, and you say, tradition meant, because of tradition, I couldn't thank her there, but you're writing in your notebook to your wife, but I thank her in my note to you. And I thought it was simultaneously sweet, like you, it's so important that you do thank them, even if they never know. I but I wonder, you know, that kind of, the importance of people knowing that even if there's no reward for the thing that they're doing. You do it anyway. Yes, you know, like I thank you. You bring it because my memory is not so good. I am, I am old. We, we talk too much, but we don't have memory. They were taking care of me wherever they could because they were poor. Taking care of my donkey. Taking care of one or two people with me. Spite poor. Leaving that area and saying that, oh my goodness, I could not see these women because of the traditions. So where I could thank them in my heart and where I could put it to another heart, which is my wife. And thank God today you are talking about that and this is how I enjoy it. Oh, it moved me tremendously. I mean, I, I remember it now. It was like, it's such a simple scene, but it was one that one can picture. And for 40 years, you're like, I've carried this thanks with me. You know, like it was important enough that I write it down. And I was like, wow, this is... Oh, this my is goodness. Good. You know, but we have a phrase. Very good. You keep it. That phrase is that mountain to mountain cannot reach you, but heart to heart. Mountains of Afghanistan cannot come to the mountains of India, but your heart and mine can touch each other if 
we do take hatred out of that. And if we say that, well, I'm a human being, he's a human being, well, those days give me this lesson that never and ever take for granted what you have or what you don't have. No, I tell you that this book is indeed a, a mirror of not just the poverty, not just, you know, sacrifice, not just the, you know, the bravery of, but this is indeed, as we started, the mirror of the hope of a nation. That's thank very good. Thank you very much. Oh, no, no, no. Thank you so much. Like, God this bless was you. so uh, enlightening. And again, thank you for coming here. I really appreciate this very much. And thank you for this book. And there will be more volumes, I'm hoping. Um, and hopefully Sage will be putting them out as soon as your son can translate them. So, you know, someone's got his work cut out for him. Bless you. All right. Well, thank you very much for joining us. And this is NL Interviews and Masood Khalili, author of Whispers of War, out uh, in stores now, uh, online as well, I believe. And that's, yeah, that's something we should consider. Great. Thank you very much, sir. And thank Bless. you for being very patient with us. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> If you like that, click here to support us and down here to subscribe to our YouTube channel and do check out the other stuff we do like news laundry interviews, why so serious, animations, comics, panel discussions, podcasts which are really big and much much more. <laughs>